Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome. A couple of quick housekeeping type announcements before we get started with our program. The first is that this session will be live streamed. You may have noticed the camera in the back as part of our virtual program for Socialism 2022. If anyone wishes to participate in the discussion that we're gonna have after Barbara presents, but doesn't want to be on the video, please just let our live stream team know and they will be sure um, to cut the stream or not film you. Um, also, just a quick COVID announcement. I think people have probably heard this in all their sessions, but in case this is your first session of the day, all socialism conference attendees are required to fully wear masks covering their nose and mouth while indoors in all of our conference spaces, including the hallways and meeting rooms. Speakers from the front of sessions may remove their masks during their presentation. However, we ask folks from the audience to please keep your mask on. That is why we have mics set up in the room so that we can all be heard clearly while wearing our masks. So that was just a reminder. Um, and we appreciate everyone following our mask policy. We really want this to be a place where people feel safe, especially the immunocompromised from the risk of contracting COVID-19. So thank you. All right, so without further ado, let's get started on our session. Um, welcome, my name is Dana. I'm with Haymarket Books. I'm going to be introducing Barbara and then helping facilitate the audience conversation afterwards. Dr. Barbara Ransby is an author, activist, and scholar. She's the author of Islanda, the large and unconventional, <laughs> the large book and large unconven and unconventional life of Mrs. Paul Robeson and Making All Black Lives Matter, Reimagining, the fr re reimagining Freedom in the 21st Century. Um, also, one of my favorites is your book on Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, which I believe we also have in the bookstore. So please check out her books up in the Haymarket bookstore. Um, and a forthcoming book called um, The Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision. Oh, no, that was the Ella Baker book. Sorry. What is your fourth book? I'm sure you will talk about it. Are we... Are we ready for revolution? What do you all think? Yes, forthcoming later this year. Um, so by way of introducing Barbara a little further, I just wanna say that the title of this session, as you all know, is Black Feminism and Black Liberation in 2022. This is an expansive and obviously urgent topic, and I can think of no better guide for this conversation than Dr. Ransby. Her deep historical writing and research is always grounded in how the lessons from past movements can inform the struggles for liberation um, in the current times. Even more critically, I feel like Dr. Barbara Ransby is somebody who helps us in imagine, imagine a future free of oppression and exploitation, which is critically important as we look around a world on fire today. After Barbara speaks, we will have some time for audience questions and participation. I'll talk a little bit more about how that's going to be managed when we get there. But without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Ramsby. How's everybody doing? Good. You look good. I'm always glad to be here. Um, I didn't realize 90 minutes in one person. You couldn't get some other <laughs> interlocutors up here to give me you a break. Can always leave <laughs> no, no. Dinner break. I think we'll have a lot to talk about. But I'm not going to, you know, preachers and professors can uh, ramble on and on. So I'm, I'm going to keep it fairly brief so we have opportunity for dialogue and discussion. Um, part of the treat for me in saying yes to speak at this conference every year is I get to meet people who are engaged and on the ground and so forth. So. Um, I want to welcome people from out of town. How many people from out of town here? Whoa, we're the Chicago people. Anybody, anybody from here? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, yeah, a little bit more. Well, we arranged beautiful weather for you. You like it? And here we are in a room without windows. Sorry about that. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I hope everyone's having a great conference. Uh, as I was walking in here today and seeing 
you know, our people in all their glory, right? Uh, sizes, colors, shapes, styles, glasses, no glasses, hair, no hair, you know, it's just like, these are our people. Um, and I think to myself, you know, uh, with all the ways in which capitalism is encroaching on every aspect uh, of our lives, you know, ravaging the planet, uh, degrading humanity and, and, and you know, really risking our future in ways that we have not seen before. Um, and with more and more billionaires wallowing in excess, you know, it is just a breath of fresh air to come into a space and into a room uh, full of people who know there's a different path and who are willing to fight for it. So I'm really glad to be here. I always get energized uh, by this conference. So this is a socialism conference, and I will start off saying a few things about socialism and capitalism. The full title of the book that I'm working on now, which is somewhat daunting, is Are We Ready for a Revolution? The Decline of Racial Capitalism and the Justice Movements of the 21st Century. And I'm trying to hang on to optimism. Uh, and every time I interview another activist, uh, I, I get buoyed in my optimism. But, but there are some formidable and ruthless enemies out there, and, and we, have, we have serious work uh, to do. But since this is a conference on socialism, I do want to say some of my thoughts that I'm working out in the book about racial capitalism as we understand it. And I should say parenthetically, and if you hear Robin Kelly tomorrow and Ruthie tonight, you know, they will reiterate this. When we say racial capitalism, we're not talking about a particular variety of capitalism. We're talking about capitalism. It's always been racial, right? We remember the theft of indigenous land based on racist premises. We know the theft of black bodies based on racist premises. Uh, and so racism has been a part of capitalism since capitalism um, existed, so through and through. So when I, I use the term racial capitalism, and I may use capitalism as a shorthand, but we know we're talking about one system um, and not some you know, sub-variety of capitalism. So um, you know, capitalism is in trouble. Um, and we know that there's cyclical crises uh, of capitalism, uh, but I think this is more significant than the cyclical crises. This seemingly all-powerful, ever-resilient system is in trouble. And it's important to name this because, you know, as I said in my welcome to you, you know, about how refreshing it is to be here, you know, capitalism seems like timeless, right? Ahistorical, right? It's, it's gonna go on forever, they keep bouncing back. I was talking to a somewhat cynical colleague recently who said to me, ah, oh, you know, in a somewhat patronizing way, he said, you know, every 30 years we on the left think capitalism is dead and done for and it bounces back. And I said, well, you know, if I know anything as a historian, it's never to say never and never to say always, right? Everything has a beginning and um, everything pretty much will have an end, so capitalism is no different. But even the capitalists know that there's something special about this crisis. Now, I don't usually go around quoting these guys, uh, but I will quote a couple of them uh, just to prove the point. Writing in the pages of the New York Times a few years ago, Mark Benioff, who's this billionaire head of Salesforce, writes, the company I co-founded has generated billions in, in profits and made me a very wealthy person. No kidding. I've been fortunate to live a life beyond my wildest imagination. Um, I, I, beyond the wildest imagination, I'm sorry, of my grandfather, who immigrated to San Francisco from Kiev in the late 1800s. Yet, as a capitalist, I believe that it's time to say out loud what we all know to be true. Capitalism as we know it is dead. Now, not quite true, <laughs> if only, um, but it does suggest something about the mindset and the concerns and the seriousness of this moment in the minds of people who have propelled it forward, defended it, and benefited from it. He goes on to say how it should be resuscitated, however, that's the part two. The billionaire British investor Jeremy Grantham says, basically the capitalist beast is out of control and it doesn't owe any responsibility to societies that it, the society we live in, the town, the state, the country. Capitalism and, and mainstream economics simply cannot deal with today's problems, end of quote. This is a hedge fund uh, billionaire. And there are many other quotes like that in the pages of Forbes, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, um, and others. Now let me also clarify you know, the, the good capitalist versus bad capitalist framework, which is a problem, right? So Robert Reich, Joseph Stiglitz, and these guys, 
are telling us you know, how bad capitalism is, but then there were the good old days of capitalism, and we just need to get back to the good old days of capitalism um, you know, in order to get beyond the excesses of uh, 21st century capitalism, right? Um, if many of you may have seen Michael Moore's uh, movie, Capitalism Love Story, very problematic. Now he grew up in Flint, Michigan. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. He describes, you know, these family vacations in the station wagon. Everybody had a, you know, had a good life and a nice house. I was like, not so much, right? That wasn't the case in working class black communities um, in Detroit. So the idea that capitalism had this golden age, yes, capitalism has gone through cycles. And I actually do agree with Robert Reich that this, we see some of the cruelest, he uses that term, some of the cruelest aspects of capitalism in this period. But it's never been good old days for us, right? For working class people, certainly for, for black and other working class people of color. Um, so I don't, um, you know, I don't wanna go on too much about that except to underscore that it's important in our strategizing as leftists, as socialists, about how to navigate the next period, about how to do our work, what we're up against and what period we're in. And I think there's, there are several aspects to this current conjunctural crisis uh, that warrant mentioning and paying attention to. One is financialization. Um, and now we, we've always had banks, there's always been that, but the, the, the role that the banks and the hedge fund uh, guys are playing is different. Um, the banks, in a sense, are also out of control and have a new role in the economy. Over the last 30 years, constituting 25% of the economy while only employing 4% of the workforce. It is a powerful, powerful sector built on, invested in, and steeped in debt. That is our debt and suffering. When they talk about selling financial instruments, it's not like a bottle or an ink pen or a phone. They're talking about this kind of amorphous thing, which is formulas for regulating money and formulas for betting on the future. It is, in a sense, a house of cards, or in other words, a Ponzi scheme. But the house of cards can't be built up forever. And so we, we are looking for another fall, and that fall, I think, and others think, uh, will be even harder than 2008. So that creates a certain instability. Um, there's a bunch of books written about this. Monthly Review has done things on this. Paul Mason and um, others have written about this. The other um, critical, critical variable in this moment of crisis is climate. Now, we know this. This is incontrovertible, right? Capitalism has a mindless obsession with growth. Growth is the measure of success. They manufacture our desires so we buy more things. They plan obsolescence of those things so we buy even more things, right? Uh, expansion, you know, in the form of various kinds of imperialist wars, uh, domination and manipulation of the global south are all hallmarks uh, uh, of capitalist growth strategies. But here is where the reality hits the fan. You can't have an infinite growth economic strategy on a finite planet. Right? And so capitalists are coming up against the wall of that reality. Um, and it's not debatable. You can deny it, but it's not debatable. It is a material reality that has to be confronted. So those are two destabilizing features. Now, we can only look to, and some of our comrades who are here at this conference who do amazing work uh, in Mississippi and other parts of the South, you know, the, the Global South and the, and the U.S. South, the floods in Pakistan and Jackson, Mississippi are immediate immediate and horrific uh, examples of the growing and deepening and frightening climate crisis. So these destabilizing features of capitalism are a part of our current reality that have not always been the case. Um, now, what I'll say to that is this. Capitalism is not just going to go away. Capitalists are not going to take a victory lap and gracefully step off the stage of history. Um, but it does create opportunities for the left. It does create a situation where we have openings to do organizing in a new and different way. There are also competing solutions to the current crisis, and we see that in the form of right-wing white nationalism, vigilantism, an authoritarian appeal of certain sectors uh, of the capitalist class. That is also an alternative. 
So the future is not determined, it is not guaranteed, it is not promised us, neither is victory. It is a struggle and it's it contested. So this brings me to the question of black feminism. So why at a conference on socialism do we have a session on black feminism? I said, what do you want me to talk about? I think they said black feminism. I said, that fits just fine. But the question of black feminism, the question of black feminism is very much related to what strategies we develop in fighting for 21st century, century socialism. I would argue that the black feminism that I identify with, define, and embrace has to be at the heart of a 21st century struggle for socialism. <clears throat> the spirit of black feminist resistance has been, in fact, at the center of the struggle against the commodification of human life and the degradation of human labor for generations. As much as some theorists on the left want to marginalize it and reduce it to various caricatures and one-dimensional um, portraits, it has been at the center. And I would say, let me also say, I'm talking about a certain, a certain strain of a black feminist tradition, which is the predominant strain of the black feminist tradition, which is radical and left. Now we do have now some um, very academic black feminists who don't want to talk about capitalism and who don't want to talk about struggle. But in the main, people who have identified with a black feminist tradition have also identified with the fight against capitalism um, and the fight for socialism. Let me also be clear that by centering black feminism, I am not talking about essentialism. I am not saying follow any black woman. Be careful if anybody tells you to do that. We're not, we're not following Val Demings or Condoleezza Rice or whoever gets scrounged up, right? I, do mean to I don't mean to suggest that most of us, uh, that, that we are having some kind of form of bio uh, radicalism. Our politics are not in our blood, our ancestry, our hormones. Uh, they, they are in our heads and in our hearts. What I'm talking about specifically is a political tradition and a set of ideas grounded in the collective experiences of poor and colonized and working class black women all over the world, articulated by organizers and insurgent intellectual, intellectuals over a period of decades and centuries. To map that tradition, we can look at Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, who freed themselves and others from bondage and staked out their claims as women uh, who were leaders of the abolitionist movement of their time. We can look more recently to the 1970s and the Combahee River Collective, and this conference has been the host uh, of a number of discussions on the Combahee River Collective. I remember maybe the last time I was here in person, uh, we had Demita Frazier and Barbara Smith and Kianga Yamada Taylor in a session uh, on Kianga's book, uh, which revived the importance of the Combahee River Collective statement from the 1970s. This was not a statement that talked about gender justice in some sort of narrow sense, or even about race politics in some sort of narrow sense. They talked about an anti-imperialist politic. They talked about a politic of anti-capitalism. They talked about labor struggles. Uh, they talked about the environment. Right? That is a hallmark of black feminist praxis is this holistic approach to how we change ourselves and the world. We can also look to uh, the radical lesbian poet Audre Lorde, who taught us that the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house, which means we have to be creative. We have to do some heavy lifting in our own time to figure out the conditions of our oppression in this moment in order to get free. There's no tone from another time that's going to give you a blueprint. That would be nice, but it's not true, right? She also talked to us about single movements are dead ends because we don't live single issue lives. Single issue movements are dead ends because we don't live single issue lives. So what does that say? We have to have a multi-sectoral movement. And then there's the prolific and subversive writer, Bell Hooks, who I will say a little bit more about in a minute who died um, earlier this year. So then, you know, we think of this conference and we think of people like Angela Davis and Ruthie Gilmore, radical feminist abolitionists, co-founders uh, of Critical Resistance, Beth Ritchie, co-founder of Insight, Women of Color Against Violence. These were, were and are feminist strategists and thinkers and organizers who are also immersed in bigger struggles for changing the world, right? Through a feminist lens, with a feminist uh, uh, politic. 
Many people in this room, you know, uh, Ashley Henderson and Tanya Lee, uh, Donna Murch, who is also on this program, Asha Rinsby Sporn, uh, and people internationally, Bill Mares in Salvador de Bahia, Brazil, uh, Francia Marquez Mina, the Afro-Colombian environmental organizer and former domestic worker who is the current vice president of Colombia, right? Um, the list goes on and on. I name these names because black feminists working in a black feminist tradition are embedded in every sector, in every frontline community, and every struggle that we can name, certainly in this country uh, and around the world. When Occupy Wall Street uplifted this notion, the, the slogan, this is what democracy look like, looks like, we can turn that on the subject at hand and say this is what black feminism uh, looks like. Black feminism and all those working in a black feminist tradition. And black left feminism has had a critical uh, role to play even before, oh, I'll slow down, even before the term intersectionality. In other words, there was a practice before there was a label, and that's very important. There was a practice before there was a label. Right. Um, so, uh, so parenthetically, I also want to say that we have to banish the idea that fighting white supremacy and racial, racist colonial paradigms and heteropatriarchy is somehow about something called identity, right? It is not about our identity. It is about our politic. It is about our aspiration for a better world and our commitment to fight for it and our ability to draw on our collective experiences in waging that fight, okay? And who better to challenge this caricature of black feminism, this distorted view of black feminism than bell hooks? Um, and I, I wanna just insert some reflections on bell hooks uh, Bell Hooks is somebody I knew for 30 years. We did not always agree, uh, and, but, but we miss her. Because if anything, she was, she was straight talking. And she talked about the need to combat capitalist white supremacist patriarchy. And people sometimes you know, said, wow, that's a mouthful, right? But it's a holistic view of the fight in front of us, and she did not shy away from it. Bell was a feminist, a radical feminist thinker, freedom fighter, who spoke to us on many levels and in many places. She died way too early. She was born Gloria Watkins into a patriarchal and sometimes abusive middle-class family. She was a rebel and a rigorous thinker, and she made herself into a radical intellectual despite the intentions of the academy. And by intellectual, I certainly don't mean the ivory tower variety. She wrote for and to ordinary people. She wrote about how we need to change systems and ourselves. Her books were read in elite college classrooms, domestic and state violence survivor groups, labor organizations, and maximum security prisons, literally. Some of you may have seen The Feminist in Cell Block Y, which is a, uh, that wasn't one of the maximum security, that was minimum security prison, but a prison where bell hooks was taught, uh, you know, as uh, men, incarcerated brothers, we're wrestling with issues of gender and feminism. <clears throat> so I take five things away from Bell Hooks' writings, and I think they're relevant to us today. One I've already alluded to, we have to transform ourselves in order to transform the world. Oftentimes we talk about systems in a large way, but we don't talk about the cultural aspect of capitalism and how it manipulates us into almost not thinking we are worthy of a better society, right? Of enticing us to buy into a set of values that's part of the glue that holds the system together. And Bell Hooks talked about that eloquently. She also insisted that we don't have the luxury of anti-intellectualism. We need to know how this system works. You think of changing anything, you need to know how it works in order to know how to dismantle it. But oftentimes we're impatient. We don't wanna sit with a text, we don't wanna uh, be patient with our comrades in a debate or a disagreement. But that is a part of the work. That is as much a part of the work as marching on a picket line. That is as much a part of the work as organizing a campaign. It is as much a part of the work uh, as a vigil, a strike, or any other form of protest. We have to do that work together. We have to make it collective work, and we have to be rigorous in it. 
She also insisted in her writings that we have to be radically democratic and inclusive uh, in our organizing. Now, you know, the left has had problems with democracy, right? We talk about it in organizations that have been democratic centralist organizations have been much more centralist than democratic. But democracy, and not the artificial form of democracy where you go and pick you know, one person who's gonna mess over you versus the other person who's gonna mess over you, but democracy where we get together and really make decisions together. And one of the ways in which I've come to appreciate the work of Stacey Sutton and others who do work around uh, cooperative economics is co-ops provide one of those ways to rehearse ways of making decisions together, right? We're not gonna co-op our way to uh, socialism. But, uh, but co-ops and other forms of collaborative decision making give us a dress rehearsal for functioning in a different kind of society, right? So we have to, f we have to fight for an expansive, radical definition of democracy. At the same time, we use some of the tools that we have in the society. And there's a big discussion we could have about electoral politics, which are both necessary and insufficient. Um, but democracy, that, the radical form of that, of people deciding and self-governing, um, is really something that has to be embraced in our movements and taken much more uh, uh, seriously in our fights. And she talked a lot about love. We have to center our work on love. And I will say, my generation of activists in particular, you know, I've known a lot of angry revolutionaries. And I'm angry most of the time. But you have to step back and say, who are you fighting to make the world better for? Not just who and what you're fighting against. And that's really critically important. That motivation, that energy, the willingness to sacrifice in that vein will take us a lot further than just being mad as hell. Although being mad as hell in this moment is quite appropriate. Um, and then again, this question of feminism uh, as a practice. You know, in one of Bell Hook's writings, she said, I don't say I am a feminist, I say I do feminist work. What does it mean to do feminist work? That's up in the ante, right? You know, I am a feminist, like, you know, I am left-handed or I am, you know, uh, a fan of X or Y. I mean, these are sort of opinions or styles or, or, or identity markers. But to say I do feminist work, or I do work in a black feminist tradition begs the question, what are you doing? And who are you doing it with? And how are you doing it? So that's very important. So what does a black feminist praxis grounded in black left ideas look like in the 21st century? It looks like the Afro-Puerto Rican feminists who were fighting on the front lines of the struggle in Puerto Rico in 2019 and continue to this day. Uh, groups like La Col and Colectiva Feminista in Construcción. Um, these Afro-feminists linked the struggle against colonialism and the corruption of the governor of Puerto Rico at that time with violence against women, right? With the, the crisis and emergency of violence against women in Puerto Rico and uh, many other parts uh, of the world, in Latin America in particular. That is what black left feminism looks like in the 21st century, right? It looks like black, indigenous, and women of color leadership that ignited, sustained, and advanced the framework of prison industrial complex abolition, that nurtured it into a framework that is now applied to a much larger body of work, which is not just about abolishing, but is, as is often insisted upon, it is about building, and not only about police and prisons, but about racial capitalism itself, about heteropatriarchy itself, and all forms of empire and colonialism. And we have to be about the building as much as we are about the dismantling. You know, Gramsci talked about this notion of interregnum, right? When something, our, our dear, another feminist who left as far too soon as Leif Mullings, who worked closely with me in the Rising Majority and the Black Radical Congress years ago. And Leif would remind us of this notion of interregnum. And interregnum is when the old thing has passed away, but the new thing has not yet been created, right? Um, and into that space can be chaos and danger and creativity. Uh, but we have to be mindful of the building alongside the dismantling, what we are for as much as what we're against. And sometimes, you know, envisioning and imagining might seem like a luxury because we feel so much like we are under assault, 
right? Every day, you, you know, when I walk in my neighborhood, I have, uh, I, I live on a, a block in, on the south side where at one end of the block, a multi-million dollar monument to our first black president is being built, right? And people are busy making sure it's, you know, fancy and everything's in order. At the other end of the block is a houseless neighbor, Carrie, who has mental illness, who we have, you know, who's been a part of our lives for two years in various ways and we can't figure out any way, although we've tried almost every way, to find housing for her, right? So there's, you know, that at one end of the block, this at the other. All of this is a part of our everyday reality under capitalism, and so it is no wonder that we are mad. But when we see these things, we have to use our imagination and say, if we had power, if we had a different kind of society, what would that look like? How would that be different? And it definitely would be, it would have to be different. So um, the message of black feminism is that we not, not only need to change some things, we not only need to change a few policies, we not only need to address a few problems, but as Ruthie will reiterate this evening, we need to change what? Everything. Yeah, I was so happy that that was the title of the conference. But of course, that begs other questions, doesn't it? Um, the question is not simply that we have to change everything, but how do we go about that work? How do we go about that work? Um, several things are on my mind um, in terms of that. And I should say as a preface, you know, my own political practice uh, at the moment is to work with um, a group called Scholars for Social Justice, which is trying to build areas of intellectual work and research outside of the academy uh, where you know, people with credentials from the movement, credentials from the street, credentials from their own independent um, work, you know, share with students and others you know, their understandings of the world, and we build from there. We also support Cops Off Campus and a whole number of, of student struggles and uh, labor strikes that have happened on university campuses. And universities have, have always been, and increasingly uh, are, sites of contestation over how capitalism will train the next generation, about how capitalism will normalize its abuses uh, of our humanity, et cetera. So it's always been a fight there, which is an intellectual fight, but, but also a real fight um, over resources as universities gentrify and so forth. The other project is uh, working with the Movement for Black Lives, and uh, Ashley Henderson's here in the, in the back, and we are on something called a Cross Movements Table Together, which is about building connections uh, between multi-sectoral organizations, but also internationally being a part of networks of international solidarity um, as much as possible and understanding that has to be central to, to our work. And the other is the Rising Majority, uh, which was created by the Movement for Black Lives, which is a national coalition, including labor, immigrant rights groups, et cetera. Um, and, and that's the big tent work that is so important. So th that's kind of my political practice. We also have a group here called the R3 Coalition in Chicago, um, Resist, Reimagine, Rebuild Chicago. Uh, so what are our challenges in doing this work? One challenge is the nonprofit industry and the NGOization of our movements, and this is not a problem only in the United States, but globally. So, you know, money changes everything. <laughs> uh, so the, the issue of how we are accountable, how we relate to philanthropic organizations that have their own agendas, which they always do, and how we move towards self-funding our movements, right? I often talk, I'm a very secular person, um, although when I hear Niall Fort preach, I get a little happy. But, uh, but, but I, you know, I think of something like secular tithing. How do we make sure that we build in supporting and contributing to the organizations that we believe in? That has to be a strategy. Ways of dealing with internal issues of conflict and violence, and this has convulsed so many movements, movement organizations um, in this period. The goal of accountability is often not met with strategies for accountability, capacity for accountability, et cetera. And, and Tanya Lee is gonna help us with this in a new project that she's, that she's launching. 
The other is the tendency to get sucked into the vortex of the Democratic Party without a clear left agenda. And every electoral cycle, this happens, right? You know, we gotta get our good people elected, yes. And I, I listen, when we talk about electoral work and the lesser two evils, we do want less evil in the world. And people who have, done, who have lived under authoritarian regimes know that it is a different terrain of struggle. So it is not like I have ever voted for uh, uh, any politician uh, thinking that that was my, the locus of my political work, that that was going to lead to liberation and freedom and justice, but it does have the capacity to mitigate harm and to give us a little oxygen in the, in the work that we're doing. But we have to have a bigger movement that contains that work, right? We can't be, you know, immediately when political campaigns are launched, and we have several socialist city council people here in Chicago, and uh, we see a number of very progressive candidates running around the country, but we can't just get, you know, get dragged along in the game. We have to say, what a, from a left perspective, from the perspective of people who would like to see a socialist society, what is our agenda, what is our role, um, you know, what is our bottom line? The other uh, challenge I think we're confronted with is this question of ideological clarity, which goes back to Bell Hook's reminder of the dangers of anti-intellectualism, that we have to talk about what is possible, we have to define our terms, we have to be willing to do the study necessary to get us on firm ground. And we're not gonna all disagree, and we're not gonna all agree. But we can only disagree in a principled way if we come from a grounded set of understandings. And we have to be willing to move, right? The, you know, what, what I do for a living is teach at a university, right? And the training there is, you know, you get entrenched in a certain set of ideas, you brand a term or two, uh, you, you, you throw your book out there, and then you defend it. It's not this idea of collective thinking, the idea to change your mind because you're a part of a group of people and you can all think better and clearer together is not in the, in the culture. But it has to be in our culture and we have, to, we have to take it seriously. So that fight for ideological clarity is very um, important. And we have to um, understand that, again, the, the fight against racial capitalism is part and parcel of the fight against racism, heteropatriarchy, and all forms of domination. And we have that argument in the left. And we have to have that argument. And people who you know, have seen at these conferences, right, would argue that you know, these issues divide us, right? That the working class is all in the same boat. We might be in the same boat, but some of us are in steerage and some of us are in you know, other parts of the boat, right? So we have to understand that racism is not just an add-on to capitalism. Heteropatriarchy is not just an add-on. These are intrinsic to the beast itself, right? And, and until we accept that, we are not gonna build principal multiracial coalitions. We can do opportunistic multiracial coalitions, but we're not gonna have principled multiracial coalitions. And we have to have a global framework for our work. We have to learn uh, from the, the landless workers movement in Brazil. We have to learn from people in the streets in Haiti who we hear nothing about in the mainstream media. We have to find new ways to get that information. Right? We have to learn about the struggle in South Africa. And I don't mean the you know, ANC aborted struggle for, against apartheid, I mean the struggle right now, uh, let, being led in large part um, by young people. We have to learn from what's happening in northern Syria with the Rojava uh, movement and women who are you know, fighting for their lives, feminist, confederalist, anarchists, who are waging a you know, life and death struggle. Um, and there's much to learn there. So all of that said, it sounds daunting, but I think about this past period, and, I, and again, I started by telling you I'm holding on to optimism. 26 million people were in the street in response to George Floyd's murder. 26 million, that's a lot of people. Now, they were not all in the streets for the same reasons. Maybe some of them didn't even know why they were there. They just felt like, I don't wanna be on the wrong side of history. Um, for some people, it was a bridge too far. It was like the, this, this visual uh, a trauma in front of them, this visual torture in front of them, man being murdered uh, you know, while he's captured on cell phone, calling for his mother, uh, it was, was too much, right? And so people had to decide where they stood, and so they went in the streets. But I've said a number of times, for those of us who consider ourselves organizers, I'm about to retire from organizing, so those of you who 
Uh, um, I've been doing it for 40 some years and you know, I just gonna look to y'all. But anyway, uh, I'm only partly joking. But, 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 but in the organizing community, it's political malpractice to not organize those 26 million people, to give them an entry to our movement, to give them accessible language to understand what we're up against and why they saw what they saw. That's so outrageous. Why they saw what they saw. There's a bigger story there, right? You know, it's not just about George Floyd's life or Breonna Taylor's life, it, it, death. It's about their lives. What lives are vulnerable? What lives are on the margins? What lives are expendable, right? In our society, it is poor people, it's working class people, it is queer and trans people, uh, it is people, it is women in many places, right? So who is vulnerable determines the power hierarchies in the society we live in. So, so, so that was a moment that should give us optimism. The choices that people made in that moment, all those millions of people. Also, my friend Kathy Cohen does a political survey of young people, um, and she surveys a lot of young people of color. And it turns out they don't like capitalism. And it turns out that they also think revolution of some sort will change things for the better. So it's interesting. Again, we don't know what revolution means to them. We don't know what capitalism means to them. But we do know that there's an opening in the way people are viewing the world and the future. And that opening is an invitation for organizers to organize and to provide an alternative. And to be willing to have the alternative that you think you have right now be modified in the process of building a mass movement uh, with real people. The Amazon workers and Starbucks workers and teachers and campus workers who are organizing and who've gone on strike you know, in recent, uh, in recent years. The fact that millions of people, despite you know, some weaknesses in the campaign, but this many, millions of people voted for an openly socialist uh, Democratic nominee for, for president. Are those people in our movement, right? Are we waging principled struggle um, with those people? So we are in a, in a precarious position, in a position where things could go in any number of directions. There are challenges to be sure, but in the final analysis, it is how we seize the opportunities that will determine the future. Uh, again, I have been reminded of that Gramsci quote about um, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. <laughs> and we have to embrace the optimism of the will. That is what's reflected in the work that many of you do. I try to manifest that in the work that I do. And I look forward to a conversation with all of you about work that we can do. So thank you. So, so 45, 45. I'm fine. I can, and I can do this too. I'm happy to moderate the discussion. Okay. It doesn't look like too unruly a crowd. I don't know. I also want to say a lot of folks have come in since we started, and I want to be sure people are as comfortable as possible in a pretty packed room. There are a few seats up here, and I'm also going to move some of these chairs off the stage. If people really need to sit in a chair to be comfortable, I want to invite you to come up and sit. There's also plenty of room up here on the floor if you need to lean against the wall. There's a bunch of chairs. Yeah. And the thing. I want to thank you all for coming because I know that there's some really badass sessions in, down the hall. So thank you for coming. Like half of you are my friends, but uh, the rest of you <laughs> and family. <laughs> Questions or comments? So we are asking if folks, in order for it to be well heard by the room and the live stream, come up to this mic, which I realize is set for a very small person, so you might need to raise it a little bit. But there's a mic right here in the middle of the room. So maybe we can invite folks to line up or come to the mic with your comments or questions. We are asking, since it's a very crowded space and we want as many voices as possible to participate, that folks keep their comments to a couple of minutes. And I might politely ask you to wrap up if you go a lot over that. So please, 
It's not because I disagree with what you're saying. It's just so we can have as many folks participate as possible. So go ahead. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I'll moderate. And, and, and the other thing is, I, you know, for my benefit, I'm curious, with duly noted, um, but uh, I'm curious about how you see black feminist praxis in your own work and what we need to do better in movement. I mean, you don't have to answer that, you personally, but I'm just saying, first, feel free to share. First of all, I'm just nervous. <laughs> oh, don't be nervous. Um, thank you for an amazing talk. Um, my name is Rabab, I'm from Sudan. Um, and I would just have a question that is I actually cannot find an answer for, especially being here in the US, specifically in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with sexual harassment and how do we approach that. Um, the, there is this concept, and I would, I would go and say that this is um, a liberal feminist concept, that by nature of just being a woman, that we have to believe women. And what you said earlier kind of brought that to the front of my mind, especially being here and knowing the story of Emmett Telt, for example. So um, how would we go about um, the, the whole setting where sexual harassment will happen is usually a setting where you cannot prove it and you cannot hold the victim um, responsible for proving that they were hurt, they were harassed, but at the same time, there is a lot of power that plays in it. Sometimes maybe um, it has to do with like um, a socialist capital or actually like from, from, from a socioeconomical point of view. Mm -hmm. So how do we approach that? And how do we actually um, come to peace with the fact that um, w the purpose is the human being itself. Even whoever actually committed that harassment, they are a victim to some point because they lost touch, they got disconnected with the human in them, and they saw um, violence as the only way to acquire such an intimate practice, for example. So how do we do that? How do we escape that we have to believe women just by the virtue that they're being women, knowing that it's actually really difficult for women to speak up? Mm -hmm. um, and just knowing that there's a lot of power structure that plays into um, the man versus the woman, um, like none of them are necessarily innocent or violent by nature. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's a huge question. I don't have a simple answer. I know multiple people in multiple organizations in this room have dealt with this question at length and in depth and in most cases not to a satisfactory resolution. Did everybody hear and understand the question because it was a little muffled because of the mask, I think. You know, around the issue of sexual harassment and particularly do we believe all women all the time, that notion that we believe women, um, and then how do we exact, a, you know, a framework of accountability in our, in our movement. So I, can, I won't list the organizations, but, you know, many organizations are dealing with this. We deal with it as a movement. You know, I think that the, the biggest challenge is to create a culture that prevents sexual harassment and sexual violence in the first place. And we have a culture that does the exact opposite. You know? So that's the big task at hand. But then in our movements, I think there is, there is accountability and it is not a formula and it's not a reflex to say that every time anybody says something, it's accurate. It's not always accurate. But what we also know is that it's very, very prevalent. Right? It's very, very prevalent. You know, I often think, and I have this conversation with my daughter sometimes, you know, the sort of intergenerational aspects of this. I think my generation of women and feminists, you know, sexual harassment was like that, that was in the air and nobody, you know, there was no language before I claimed the language of feminism, right, of radical feminism, to even talk about what was wrong with that. It's just how things are, you know, and it happens on a spectrum you know, from saying things to casual touching. And I think we do have to talk about the spectrum because every form of harassment and every form of assault and violation is not the same. We shouldn't, we, we don't want any of it, but it's not, it's not all the same. And so we have to be nuanced in our, in our treatment. And so the idea of transformative justice, reparative justice is very important. I have learned more about it and embrace it um, and have great hope for that. It doesn't solve everything. It doesn't solve everything. So I don't know that I have a satisfactory answer to your question. I appreciate the seriousness of the question, and I certainly you know, open it to anybody else who wants to offer 
um, thoughts on how we should respond to this. I will say, you know, I teach sometimes at Stateville Prison here in um, Illinois, and some of my students, I don't ask my students why they're there, but many of my students will tell they've done horrible things to people. And so it is not denying that harm is done, but do we embrace an ethos of accountability and at some level forgiveness, not without accountability, right? It's like we say, no, no justice, no peace. We want peace, but we want justice to go with it. So the accountability builds in something needs to change, right? And, and if it doesn't, something else needs to happen. So it's not to let people off the hook, I'm sorry. Like the biggest uh, debate in South Africa around truth and reconciliation was a lot of people who had done very, very horrible things basically said they were sorry and were able to, you know, kind of, is that accountability? That was not a satisfactory accountability uh, for most people. So anyway, thank you for that question. I, I wish there was a better, stronger answer that I had. I'm not sure that, that there is right now, but I, I do think this generation of movement organizers are taking it very seriously, that there's, you know, healing committees, there's accountability committees, there's all of that in many of these organizations, which was in my, my entry to politics, there was none of that. Um, so I, I see that as a sign of progress, even though incomplete. I think, I think they want us to, people to go yeah, to the, you love your earrings too. Hello, good Hi. afternoon. My name is Nia Johnson. I'm from the DC DMV area. I'm happy to build on a remark you just made regarding how some of these organizations have healing embedded into their framework for liberation and feminism. And I was just hoping it, or wondering if you could speak a little bit more on where black feminism and black liberation intersects with somatic healing aimed at treating our traumas, decolonizing our bodies, to better equip ourselves to engage in the long fights that we pursue. As it pertains to my work, I look at economic policy and housing policy and also grapple with the reality that I do have personal experiences with economic injustice and housing injustice. And so wondering how, as a movement, we frame the balance between healing and also staying energized to keep pushing forward when we see how the odds are stacked against us. Yeah, and I think you have some of the answers in your, you know, in your, in your question. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of BOLD, which is Black Organizing for Liberation and Dignity. Is that the, yeah. Um, Denise, um, what's Denise's last name? Perry. Perry, right. Um, Denise Perry in Florida, who, who organizes these sessions. I don't. Are you familiar with Bold? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. Because they <laughs> bold, bold people in the room. Um, they 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 practice a kind of um, somatic, you know, healing, um, catharsis, uh, connectivity, physical empowerment, embodying, you know, our politics and our practice. Right, being in touch with our bodies our ancestors as a part of making yourself whole enough and healthy enough to do the work and supporting each other. Because a lot of times, um, you know, there's personal tensions, there's competition, there's egos, there's all kinds of um, human qualities that get, you know, that play into our work like they play into our lives and our society. And so BOLD is one of the models, I think, you know, it's a, it's a sort of retreat that people go on, they build relationships, they get healing practices, they, um, get, they buy into a network, a supportive network of, of people who um, help and coach and mentor each other. So that would be one, oh. one model for that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Greetings. My na name is Allison. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I will, uh, well, I organize with National Women's Liberation, um, which comes out of Red Stockings and also mm. Gainesville Women's Liberation in the South, and I organize with the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. Um, my question is, in, in speaking of black feminists, um, I have wondered, in particular, in the Kambahi River Collective Statement, mm -hmm. um, why uh, people like 
France, uh, Fran Beal, um, Zahara Simmons, other feminist leaders that came out of SNCC um, were not included in as, as reference points uh, there. And I'm wondering where you would place um, organizers like them in the black radical feminist tradition. Um, and I'll just say as background in answer to your question on organizing, uh, I'm not sure that this is the answer, but in, in my groups, I'm, I'm sort of in four groups, right? <laughs> I'm in the Malcolm X grassroots movement, which has a new African women's caucus, which is necessary, absolutely, and insufficient. And I'm also in National Women's Liberation, which has a women's caucus, uh, sorry, a women of color caucus, which is absolutely necessary and also insufficient. So, so if you're a woman of color, sometimes you're in like four groups. Um, and so I don't know, I, I think that may be a, a needed way to organize, um, but yeah. perhaps there are better ways. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. I mean, it's always interesting, like the, how do we connect the dots of all the different uh, areas of work that we're, that we're doing? And some of it will overlap and some of it won't, right? Um, how, do, how does Fran Beal and Zahara Simmons, two people I know very well, many years, uh, fit into the Combahee River. So Combahee River Collective statement was a statement, you know, it came out of Boston, uh, and people who broke with the National Black Feminist Organization, they felt at the time was too liberal, um, and were responding to uh, violence and, and, and murders of black women in the Boston area. So it grew out of a very specific group of people doing organizing in a very specific place. At that time, Fran was on the West Coast and, you know, had already written, I forget what year she wrote, Double Jeopardy. Uh, which was an important intervention. We'd been involved in the Third World Women's Alliance and the SNCC Women's Caucus. And Zahara was still doing work in the South. Zahara, of course, is now doing a lot of work about you know, family violence and family sexual violence with her daughter, Aisha. So I, I don't think, you know, Combahee is not the um, you know, epicenter of black feminist organizing. I was in a group called African, Women, Af um, African American Women in Defense of Ourselves and the Ella Baker Collective. And there are many, you know, there are many examples of this, but that document that was produced, I think, captured a sentiment that is so important, which just lays out, you know, almost in bullet point fashion, you know, the different areas of oppression and fight back that they were endorsing and embracing as a black feminist. Uh, practice. So that's why it gets held up. But yeah, those other stories are important too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Petra and I'm actually from Toronto. Uh, and thank you for your talk. And I'm a bit nervous myself. Don't be nervous. Why are people right? nervous? But, you, uh, you're probably in the friendliest room that you've been in a long time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to, you know, to the question of how do I practice, uh, I actually think coming to a conference like this is part of transforming self, so there's an example, I'm sure, for everybody that's here. And um, what I want to ask you about is good versus bad capitalism, financial feminism, and uh, I want to, in my, in my work experience where I work with is uh, what I would call women entrepreneurs of all backgrounds, but who operate micro enterprises, and the most—that's the majority of small businesses, like micro enterprises, less than one to four people. It's the big chunk of things. And what I notice in that space over many years is that there's a lot of uh, marginalized folks that start businesses: new immigrants, uh, women who are corporate refugees, or traumatized to the point where working somewhere else just isn't going to go, isn't going to happen. Uh, women who've been incarcerated, who aren't eligible to work anywhere else, starting businesses. I work with those organizations. And they're starting enterprises to create right livelihoods for themselves and their, and their folks, and they want to pay their people well. But they don't see themselves part of this conversation because they feel like imposters. They're like, we're kind of capitalists, aren't we? Because we have a business but we really don't want to be part of capitalism because that's what got us into this situation in the first place. And so how do we reconcile, how can the left mobilize micro radical micro-enterprise owners uh, and not leave them out of the conversation because the capitalist conversation for a lot of folks feels like I don't belong there, yet mm -hmm. I know they do because I work with them all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's thank you my for question. that question. You know, I think this question of small businesses and capitalism often comes up, right? I, you know, I think it's a very thin line sometimes of small businesses that are, that function more like co-ops, right, uh, than, than for-profit business, even though technically they may be for-profit 
businesses, but everybody works there. It's not like a boss, you know, sitting in on a yacht somewhere and exploiting workers' labor in order to make a profit, right? So I do think that we have to talk about small businesses in a certain, but the aspiration of a lot of small businesses is what? To become a big business. <laughs> so, so it depends on the trajectory of that business, the organization of that business. I think we can't be dogmatic about, you know, somebody owning a bodega is the same as Bezos or, you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And in fact, there's a tension between small businesses and big capital. Now, in the sort of old Marxist uh, uh, lingua franca, we talked about petty, you know, petty bourgeois uh, stratum. Uh, that can be a professional class as well as small entrepreneurs, but it's a question of the political identification and how are you actually supporting yourself. If you're working every day at the store, you know, that's a whole different thing than if you have 100 people working for you and basically paying them as little as possible, charging as much as possible for uh, the product in order to accrue uh, surplus value and, and, and live well. That's a different formula than a bunch of family members working at a store. I'm not sure where the line is, but I do know there's a tension there too because a lot of times there is an identification and an aspiration in small businesses who, who become kind of the, the PR, the poster children, if you will, for big business. People say, Capital, you know, capitalism's great. Look at all these entre you know, entrepreneurs in your neighborhood. Are they the problem? Kind of hiding behind them, doing their dirty work. So, um, so I think we have to have a nuanced view about small businesses, understanding that tension of aspirational and identification versus what is the real contours of their lives. But I also think you know, the idea of workers' co-ops is, is one way to kind of get around that, where people are benefiting from their own labor and then the, you know, whatever comes back to the collective goes into the collective and goes to social you know, causes. So, yeah. Hi. Hi, thank you. Um, my question kind of falls under. You can answer some questions too, as well as ask questions. <laughs> yeah, I will say that I'm actually one of those uh, for-profit entrepreneurs, and I think yeah. one of the lessons what you I've selling? had. Huh? What you selling? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> uh, I do consulting around like okay. tech abolition work, um, and one of the things that I've definitely had to deal with is realizing how much the employer is incentivized to exploit your laborers and how difficult it is to stay in business. Mm -hmm. That's a side Sounds like you're selling your labor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so my question for you is, um, you spoke really eloquently uh, about the challenges of working within the nonprofit industrial complex. A lot of the movement is funded work. Um, most organizers are also workers. What does it mean for us to be working towards abolition and in a way which is compensated and often professionalized? Mm -hmm. um, what are the different tensions there and what guidance do you have for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a, so I also in my day gig, we, you know, we, I try to do my um, social justice work in the context of the university that I work in as well as very deliberately outside of it too because they don't own me and they just you know pay me um, but but we run something called the portal project which brings together artists activists and scholars to talk about um, social justice work across different boundaries and so forth and so many of the activists and most of the activists I know of this generation are paid workers and that's you know, I think it's great on one level and it's a contradiction and a tension on another level that we really do. I mean, I said it before, I do think we have to look to, to finance our movements. And at some point, it has to be what we do in that little margin called free time that we increasingly have taken away from us, you know, that our voluntary work is very important. To say, I'm supporting this group because I believe in it, not because I need a job, right? Um, and then you might have to you might have to subsidize organizers who need to do a part of that work. I'm not, you know, I'm not being a purist about it. But but we everybody doing the work can't be doing it as a career move, right? And 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 I think you know it's hard and it's hard to say that. And it's maybe easier for me to say that I've never worked as an organizer. I work for an, you know an institution that's problematic as hell, right? The university, which tells you to rank young people and deem this one smart and that one not and this one gets, and you know, it, it feels very unsavory sometimes. Um, but in my own time, I can work on support the things I believe in um, and, and, then, and then to fight and organize in my workplace um, at the same time. So, 
Yeah, and I and I think maybe what else is embedded, like a lot of movement, um, big movement organizations are getting unionized. So if you're fighting for a, 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 a campaign or a cause or a particular issue, um, and you have the f good fortune to have paid staff, then those paid staff also have to be treated, you know, in, according to the principles of, you know, of the movement and the organization. But it is a hard one, and I do think moving towards self-financing our our work um, is is important and strategizing for that. You know, so if foundations, you can view philanthropy as a form of reparations, but it becomes you become very dependent on it. So if you want to do that, and you know, sometimes, and I full disclosure, I I am on the board of a foundation in Chicago that supports organizers. Right, I'm not, you know, it's not my family <laughs> fortune or anything, but um, but I happen to be on there, and it's to mitigate harm, and it's to also you know, make sure organizers get and organizations get a little support uh, for the way, work they do. But my emphasis is to support movement building work, and there's a category of funding that we do called movement building, which is to, to limit the competition between different organizations that are fighting for funding. Uh, and then to do, no, you know, big no strings attached uh, contributions to organizations, so then organizations then have to work to, to build off of that, to create, you know, to create a co-op, let's say, or to create um, a space that is shared that then can generate um, revenues for movement. Bookstore, you know. The example I meant to give earlier, too, about the tensions between big business and small business is how behemoths like Amazon have really served to put out of business small bookstores, community bookstores, where we're also movement meeting places uh, in a lot of cities uh, because they can do it big and they can do it cheaper and they can, you know, rip off their workers much more effectively. Yeah. There ain't no neat answers to these questions, folks, you know, sorry. Um, Hello, thank brother. you, uh, Barbara, for uh, participating and educating uh, and knowing that uh, you are a educator inside of uh, Illinois prisons and just basically dealing with some of the inhumane conditions inside of Illinois prisons, such as the water situation. What would your advice be to people that are advocating for change against the Illinois Department of Corrections? It seems like it's a stronghold in fixing this issue that is affecting more than 30,000 different individuals that are incarcerated. And lastly, one thing I would like to say is this. It's always an honor for me to come here and to see the young people here. I want you to understand one thing, that change does not come with the broken down criminal justice system or any of these systems that are in play. Change comes through you, and I'm proud to see all of you up. Thank you. Before you leave the mic, speaking of educating, why don't you tell them who you are? Well, <laughs> my name is Mark Clements. Unfortunately, I wear two. <laughs> two negative titles in the uh, state of Illinois, city of Chicago, county of Cook. I was a juvenile that was sentenced to natural life inside of a prison, told that I would die. Unfortunately, I was also someone that was taken down to the police station at the age of 16, and I was tortured. So, so many of us don't understand tortured. So basically, I look at these young kids, and I see myself, opportunity that I never had, that I wish that I had, and I encourage you young kids to keep fighting because now I have watched from being a young adult, now I'm older. So now older, I can't move like I used to move anymore. I can't be as vocal as I wanna be as vocal anymore. But I encourage you all to keep fighting because we need you. And not only do we need you, wherever you come from, it's so very important to get involved into something so that we can change these conditions. These are your fathers, your mothers, your uncles, your aunts, your brothers, your children. This is your community. And if it don't change, 
We going down each and every day, but you can pull it up. Thank you. Thank you. So Mark raised the question of, I mean, I think supporting the organizing work that's going, I mean, the ultimate solution, of course, is to abolish, you know, prisons that cage human beings. Um, but, uh, but also to, to take seriously that ameliorating harm is a thing. And it's easy to say, we don't want any reforms when the reform is not going to impact your daily life. I remember Albert Woodfox who was a friend uh, who died recently, um, you know, gave a talk for us and, uh, you know, a young person stood up and said she was an abolitionist and she wouldn't support anything that furthered prisons. And he was like, well, I'm not for furthering prisons. I would be the last person. And Albert, of course, spent 43 years in um, solitary in Angola prison. Um, but he said, but, but I'm living that every day. And I want that hurt to be a little less. I want that pain to be a little less. I want a little more of my humanity and dignity. And so to never reduce that to trivial reforms is very important. Um, so yeah, supporting, supporting leadership of folks inside. Hi, um, I'm Sierra. Um, I'm with an organization called Scalawag. We're based in the US South. Scalawag. Um, Scalawag, yes. Um, and my question is about um, ideological clarity you were talking about, and I'm really curious about um, what uh, an ideological strategy looks like on a mass level. I think that's something that the right has done really well and really effectively. Um, and I think that's something that we on the left, um, I think that we have a strategy to do that once you're in movement, but if you're not in movement yet, it's a lot harder for folks to understand what our ideology is. So what does it look like for us to build that strategy for folks who are not with us quite yet? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good question. And we need to always be, oh, sorry. Oh, should I take three and two? No, I'm not. Okay. Okay, good. Good intervention. And we have till 4.30? Okay, so we have, four, yeah, so I'll be less long-winded. Uh, yeah, oh, right, your question. I'm on to the next. Yeah, no, I think that's really important how we look outward um, and that we can become very insular and in a very alienating world, it's easier to kind of like get with your peeps and, you know, you don't even finish your sentence and everybody's not, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> the point is we got to talk to other people. <laughs> We gotta talk to people who disagree with us. We gotta talk to them in the way that they listen. We have to respect the fact that we don't have all the answers. Would be nice, but we don't. Um, and I think there's various, you know, sort of portals, if you will, for that. You know, uh, which one of which is publications. Uh, so I'm very excited about, you know, Kianga Yamato Taylor is launching this new publication called Hammer and Hope. So that would be good. Public, um, popular education that a lot of organizations do, um, you know, routinely and much of it on Zoom, but the People's Forum in New York is a good model for that. You know, the, there are people there with a particular political point of view, but they are also very, um, you know, open and diverse in all the, you know, progressive forces that they invite to come to that space. So you can go there and take a, a class on dialectical materialism or, you know, the revolution in Chile or whatever. So, um, so I think sites of popular education are, are, are forums. The rising majority is doing something soon, hopefully, called Freedom Circles, encur encouraging people to self-organize in, in groups for study. Uh, and people do, like religious groups do this with, you know, sometimes very dogmatic agendas, but you know, some, but, but, but people get together and say, let's figure out the world. Let's figure out what we believe in. And we should, you know, we should invite people to do that too. The breathing room here in Chicago is a, is a spot where a lot of that happens and it often happens over food um, and, 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 and bringing neighbors from the neighborhood in to talk about, you know, different. So I think that's the, that's the kind of outward push and then building campaigns that people can just come into, right? Uh, but the ideological clarity part is creating forums, both online and publications, and opportunities for people to talk about ideas. And thinking that that's important is not just extra. Um, my question is actually kind of, I think, related to the last question. Um, I live What's in, your name? Uh, my name's Jay. Hi. Hi. Um, so I, I live in one of the few uh, majority black neighborhoods in Portland, Oregon, and you know it's been gentrified. You've been raising hell out there in Portland. I'm telling <laughs> you know. You. 
<laughs> and like, you know, it's, it's rapidly changing and all that stuff, but it's still an area where there's a lot of black people and because the black community is so small, you know, we all tend to talk to each other out in the street and stuff like that. And me being the sort of evangelical anti-capitalist, I'm, I'm always trying to, you know, talk about those kind of topics in not so many words because you ask them if they're anti-capitalist, you ask them if they're leftist, and they're like, nah, that's them white folks on the street. Like, that's them whatever, you know? <laughs> so they're very much like, even though they're aligned with a lot of the ideology, like the terms and all those things, like they're very much not about, and so they're not gonna join like a movement that like uses those terms. And so they're being like co-opted, like those folks are being co-opted by like other, I would say like reactionary spaces, like the quote unquote hoteps, you know, and like the Hebrew Israelites and like the folks that are um, enforcing patriarchy and like black capitalism. And I just, uh, I guess I just have like general question about like how, like, how can I get those folks? Like, how can I get them before the other folks get them? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, even if it's just, like, what well, readings, like, black working class folks, like, you know, would really relate to, if you have any recommendations, right, or just right. any tactics in general. Right. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I'm a teacher, so I think like a teacher sometimes. And, and when I'm in movement spaces, I think every teacher is all, also a, always a student of Paolo Freire's lesson. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I would say that people won't join a movement that uses those terms. But I think we have to be multilingual. I think we have to speak in you know, many you know, different ways, right? And there's a way in which you know, you're talking in the parking lot or you're talking to your cousin. I, my parents didn't go to college. And I always said I would write books that my parents could read, right? And I think I learned as much about the injustices of capitalism from my father, who was a factory worker and had been a sharecropper, uh, without any of the terms that I later learned in, you know, left study groups and in college. Um, but so the ideas are there and how we package them. We talk about intersectionality. You know, there's a way to say that, you know, that women of color and black women in particular carry a lot of loads, right? And they carry them at the same time. So there's ways to explain ideas and that's what you think about as a teacher, that's what you think about as an organizer. Um, but I think, you know, we sometimes underestimate the ability of people to grasp uh, or, or the fact that people already know, you know, that's that the Freerian teacher thing, you know, Bill Ayers writes about this. The Freerian teacher thing is that people have a lot of knowledge within themselves that have not been articulated, expressed, or listened to. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people can explain their circumstances and we're patient enough to listen, um, oftentimes complicated understandings of the world come out. Mm -hmm. And then we name them for convenience, you know, to have conversations and debates with each other and, you know, write articles and books. But, but, but I do think we shouldn't, we shouldn't draw that conclusion that people aren't going to. Now, people, if, you, if you're arrogant and, you know, you, you know performing your, you know, verbosity, uh, and, 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 you know, people are going to see through that. And so, they're, you know, people are, and particularly people who are working two and three jobs and have some kids at home, they're not going to, you know, they don't want you to perform being smart and telling them how oppressed they are. I think there's a patience with organizing. There's a, res there's a respect for explaining things in different ways and understanding different ways and there's different reservoirs of knowledge. So, I mean, I'm preaching, but I think all that has to go into how we do and how that manifests in any situation will be reflected by those values. Thank you. So, I gotta, I gotta rehearse speaking, giving shorter answers. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Simone Johnson. <clears throat> I live in the Chicago area and uh, next week I'll be starting as an assistant professor and that's relevant. Oh, oh, thank you. Do you want to say where and not keep it on the DL? Uh, well, at DePaul. Okay. Um, and uh, that's relevant because I, I'm teaching black feminist theory this quarter, and um, I was you know, putting together my syllabi and talking to the chair about how I was excited to talk about bell hooks, for example, and uh, they said, you know, watch out, you know, some of the new <laughs> students might be a little bit hesitant to engage with someone who called Beyonce a terrorist. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I say that to, to just pose the question of what can we as educators do to kind of resist the de-radicalization of black feminism and what can we do in order to maintain the values and the tradition of black feminist theory. I'm coming from, you know, Spelman College, trained by Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal. And, you I'm know, so that's- I'm soon, she's my dear friend. Yes, she's a wonderful uh, teacher and educator and historian of black feminism. And that's kind of the tradition I'm coming out of. And yeah. being faced with this kind of new horizon in black feminism is something I'm interested in. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, black feminists are not a monolith. I, I inserted into my comments about Bell that, you know, we disagreed on some things, that's fine. Um, so people have to, you know, 
not only take the Martins, the Malcolms, and the Marcuses off a pedestal, but also take feminists off a pedestal. Everybody, you know, every black woman's not always right, and every black feminist doesn't always agree. Um, and we fight for the positions that we believe in. And there is a tradition that has boundaries and so forth. But you know, and I, you know, I think listen to your students too, because there, sometimes there's things that come out even in students who are reticent to hear about the ideas of black feminism that are something you can draw on as an educator to get them to open up to other ideas. And they may not agree with Bell on everything, like, you know, like me. But, but there's a body of work there that is so valuable and there was such an intervention that I think you can't ignore it in a syllabus, syllabus on black feminist theory. But good luck. <laughs> Um, hi, Professor. Um, my name is Joanza. You see him pronouns. I'm here with um, BYP as a board member on the C3 Ooh, board. And, and, I'm, and I'm also representing the Afro Socialist Caucus. And I work at an organization in New York State called Vocal New York as a director of organizing. And mostly I came up here just to say thank you because I, I got to see you, um, you know, speak. And I've been following you since in 2018 at the um, BYP 100 National Convening in New Orleans, which was a transformative experience for me. Um, and I really wanted to respond to sort of your sort of question to us, like how do we how do we engage in black feminist work in our work? And yeah. I can, I mean, obviously BYP, that's obvious. But like, black Youth Project 100. Oh yeah, Black Youth yeah. Project 100. Um, but at Vocal New York, where we're a statewide grassroots membership organization, building power to end AIDS, homelessness, mass incarceration, and the drug war, and its consequences, the overdose crisis, the hepatitis C crisis, and you know, and to build an economy and democracy that works for our people um, in the state of New York, and we organize four issue-based unions. But the organization is, I would say a leftist organization, but our membership isn't always immediately leftist. And we're organizing people who are directly impacted. So one of the ways in which I deeply value you and your kind of leadership and black feminist sort of modes of analysis and ways to understand the world and how to behave, I'm always interested in using the issue-based campaign that may not be revolutionary as a vehicle by which I'm going to do the critical work to help people develop their critical consciousness to be able to demand wider demands later. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really critical thing that we have to do. And I think the reason I bring it into the conversation now is because the contradictions that have been sort of coming up that we're, you're responding to, these contradictions abound. And I think it's absolutely critical that those of us who are you know, black, queer, feminist, leftist, socialist, also understand and, and contend with the corporeal reality. And I think that black feminist politics and framework really helps us hold that complexity. And that's why I think I've benefited so much from it, from the Combi River Collective. And I, I, I think that whenever people don't understand an organization like the one I work at and through in New York State, um, I, think, I, I think when they don't understand that, that's why I don't see every black organization in the state of New York working to end homelessness whenever 87% of all people experiencing homelessness are black and brown, the yeah, vast majority yeah. of whom are black women with black children. Yeah. Uh, you know, and yeah. it, it just drives me crazy. So yeah. I just wanted to say that to really plant a seed into thank the room to work. thank you yeah. and to thank this wonderful conference. So thank, thank you. you for the work that you do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like, I'd like to uh, thank you as well, Barbara. Uh, does that come up for you? No. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, there you, whoa, okay, over your head now. Okay. All right, cool, does that work? Yeah. All right, so um, thank you for your comments. Um, I'd like to say just, uh, it was, it's good to, I guess um, some things are, in, are intimidating. You know, I think socialism can be intimidating for people. I think capitalism is intimidating. Patriarchy is intimidating. Um, feminism is intimidating, and uh, I'll say that as, how I identify that there can be a reticence to, to even come in the room. Uh, I think particularly here in Chicago, you know, we, uh, we find a lot of division. Chopping, screwing, uh, divide and conquer is the name of the game, I think, in capitalism. That's, that's how you make profit, period. Um, cocaine to crack, you know. But uh, it feels like a weekend of Bernie's kind of thing sometimes, you know, carrying around this corpse, this, you know, of, of patriarchy sometimes, of socialism. There's kind of old ways that has been done for a long time, that because we identify, I, just, I guess I just came from the identity politics thing, that's heavy in this, it kind of can limit us sometimes. And I appreciate your talking about disagreeing, inclusiveness, um, but I feel like uh, one question is, is how can we um, kind of shed that, that 
corpse. To, you know, it's, it's, it's literally like, like, I don't know what the movie's really about, but it's like two white guys walking around with a dead white guy. Wait, what, what? Weekend at Bernie's. Oh, Weekend at Bernie's. Yeah. Oh, and they're know. trying to get hooked up. They're trying to get in the plugged in, in the network, right? Okay. I don't know. I, I, it's the 80s, okay, you know? Okay, zero in on your question for me, though. Yeah. Huh? How do we, how do we, yeah. So just give so me it's, it's So we use some of these identities, yeah. which I would say, you know, can be feminism, it could be socialist, it could be whatever, to get in the room or get our foot in the door, sometimes just to, to get into the capitalist, you know, whatever. So um, I'm curious of what ways that you think, particularly through the lens of black feminism, that we can start breaking down some of those things to a lot, like us, uh, the membrane on a cell that we can let the good stuff in, have some protection, you know, for ourselves, um, but make ourselves open to be more inclusive, to, to disagree. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, just the other question, which I think is kind of big, but um, I ended up, uh, through my experience, even with the breathing room, uh, encountering um, challenges around my patriarchy, mm -hmm. you know, being put up to question. And, in, and along the vein of that in, uh, intimidation, I would say, I'd be curious, what is the matriarchy? And I, I really would love to know because I'm just purely curious what that looks like. That's something that I think is deeply powerful. It's not acknowledged. And, and perhaps there's a way without it being like racial capitalism, mm -hmm. gender capitalism or whatever, mm. putting us into a situation. Yeah. Well, we probably should, you know, need to have a bigger talk than we mm. have time for right now. Yeah, but maybe the first question. That. I you. mean, I, I, what I got from your first question is how do we get beyond some of the labels? and. Um, that can be intimidating, socialist, et cetera. And, you know, I, I think, you know, sometimes we get dismissive of labels, but, you know, words do serve a function. And, but words are always contested, right? So I say I'm a socialist. That doesn't connect me necessarily 100 with all people saying that they're socialists. Just like saying I'm a feminist or even a black left feminist doesn't mean there's not disagreement. And I don't have to carry the bags, right, or the baggage of everybody who's ever identified in that way. These are contested terms, and they're living terms. Like, they mean different things for different generations. So I, so sort of in defense of the terms sometimes, you know. But I think, you know, you're right. We have to use different kinds of language. The, th the last question you said, um, you know, about the matriarchy. I mean, there's a lot of myths about matriarchy and, ma and, and woman-centered power. You know, for example, in the black community, there's this myth around black, the black matriarchy that because black women have been strong, because black women have a different um, gender experience or racial experience than white women and certainly white middle class women, that somehow these all-powerful women are running their communities. We have patriarchal traditions in the black community. The black church is one. Right? There are all kinds of norms and practices in the black community that are in fact patriarchal and that are misogynist and that are harmful. And you know, so I think we have to tease that out. Like culture is always a moving fluid thing and there's always different components to any culture, some of which keep us alive and some of which kill us, right? Like sometimes even eating practices can be a cultural thing and authentic, but it can also kill you because you know, wherever it came from, you know, it's not healthy. So, um, you know, so I don't know, I, I don't think there's, I don't think in terms of matriarchal capitalism, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's a, a helpful frame for us. Um, but I do think we have to take seriously that sexism, misogyny uh, can come from lots of different places. And someone alluded to different forms of feminism before. It can also come from people who identify as women. Women or femmes can also have misogynist attitudes, but we don't live, it's not like a flip side of the coin. There's the matriarchy and then there's the patriarchy, right? Just like there's not, not you know, people used to talk about reverse racism. Um, that, you know, there's black people that don't like white people and there's white people that don't like black people. It's not about, it's about the systems of power that are very specific historically, you know, that we're up against. And so that's what we have to be about confronting. And maybe we'll have to do a chit chat off mic but, um, but, you know, that's what I would offer in response to you. So, but yeah, thanks I, to you, we also have... Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want to say that it was the opposite. I just was in the, in the spirit of building. Yeah. Like what is the way that we can build matriarchy in the healthy way, getting back to the roots? That, is yeah. that helpful? That's all. And I would say, I would say woman-centered power and not matriarchy, because to me that connotes a certain kind of dominating power. Yeah, that was the only thing. Yeah, okay, thank you for your question. Thank you.
And thanks to Haymarket Books and buy their books, they're great.